it's impossible to injection mold this. This guy is actually one of the most challenging carbon fiber objects that you could possibly make. But for a rocket nozzle, talking about the thermal issues that you'd normally run into, no matter what material you're using and how you guys are solving for that. Getting people to believe the complexity is a real challenge. I feel for all the founders out there, life can be really tough, especially when you have a vision that's grand and a technology that's real, but the science is complicated. Going to Mars, if someone wasn't sold on that idea, how would you try to sell them? The other reason why you need to go to Mars and, and build a fully recyclable civilization is because it's going to actually end up being incredibly low cost. We're here in Campbell, California at the HQ Orbital Composites with founder and CTO Cole Nielsen. How's it going? Uh, and and we're, we're, this is, we filmed a while ago, and that robot was almost fully working, and now it's, it's working. Oh, it's cranking right now, it's yeah. It's cranking. What is it, what is it printing? Uh, that's building a drone. So it looks like an X-Wing. Um, you can see there's a smaller one there. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, printing all four wings, one with each robot at the same time. And the fifth robot is holding it in position. So that's five robots, 30 degrees of freedom. I'm nervous for this interview because we waited about 30, 40 minutes for some of your team to complete a test where they had to have air ventilation for our safety. We're here on a Saturday filming this. Uh, you guys are <laughs> really doing stuff, pushing hard. Yeah. What led you to found oil composites originally? Yeah. So, so I started looking at drones and, and how to print drones or really there was no drone factory that was very, or drone manufacturing technology very specific to it. So uh, I wanted to basically have a drone factory. And then when I looked at it, uh, there was no drone making tool. We have carbon fiber manufacturing equipment, you know, big AFP machines, huge, you know, hundred foot long machines. Uh, and those, those make your Boeing 787 or, or what have you, the wings for that. Uh, cool. Uh, and then you have like, you know, uh, like toy drones. And, and those are made out of flat panels that are usually laser cut or water jet cut and then assemble with bolts. But there's nothing in the middle. There's no, very few helicopters that are made with carbon fiber. Very few helicopters are made with robotic carbon fiber placement. And sort of looking at what that gap would be, it's about the size of a car part, about the size of a car like we have behind us. It's eight foot cute. And, and so then after we designed a couple different tools to work with that, um, I sort of realized that what I actually did on accident was create a very tiny factory. That wasn't the point. And so then look at, oh my God, you know, that's small enough to be a satellite itself. <gasps> well, you know, I got a degree in engineering physics of space systems, Embry-Riddle. So the intention when I was at school was I could build crash fly drones all day long. And before you graduate, you'll never finish your paperwork. Right. So, so that's why I started building drones, but there's about an 80% overlap between drones and satellites. So having built a drone factory on accident, I built a satellite factory also. Well, if you launch the factory, you don't have to launch a completed satellite. And here's the business opportunity. It turns out that you've got, you know, maybe 75, 80% of the engineering man hours for a large school bus sized geostationary satellite are spent on design for launch. Only 20% of your time is spent on uh, mission design and new parts and products that go into these uh, uh, very large satellite systems. So if we launch the satellite factory, then instead of having an unfolding ratio of 20 to 1, you end up with an uh, ability to make satellites that you know, are way larger. Like they unfold at 300 to 1 when you're printing them. But it's more than that. Because, you know, you you have to deal with sound and air pressure changes and, and just the pure violence of launch will liquefy a person. So um, that's how violent these rockets are. And if you never have to deal with that, you can build your satellite now out of just like spider webs and springs. That's like a snowflake thing. And, and it can be absolutely huge. And you can design it five times faster because people are only designing for the mission itself. So in a nutshell, um, you know, if you launch the factory, you have five times larger workforce um, and the rate of evolution increases because all the design hours are spent on the mission itself. So that's orbital composites. I have a lot of follow up questions, uh -oh. one, of, one of which working at a satellite company, I personally don't see a lot of 
the similarities between a drone and a satellite. Can you expound on that a little bit and clarify clarify sure. what you see as the similarities are? Uh, well, let's start with mass. I mean, the math on how they work and a roll moment and all those things, that's the same. So the control systems interactions are the same. When we're dealing with uh, the CPUs, the CPUs could actually be literally the same CPU to control it. It's got antennas and radios. Okay, that, so do drones. That's not different. Um, what's the major differences are uh, the air pressure. I can use wings on one and I'm using thrusters on the other, right? And then beyond that, the radiation environment's a little bit different. And the materials, only some things need to change a little bit to help deal with like uh, collection of charges from the atmosphere when you're way, way up in, in low Earth orbit. Um, you need to think about collecting uh, static charge on the outside of your vehicle. Um, so that's more intense than with a drone. But other than that, primary structure, secondary structure, hinges, bearings, wires, connectors, waterproofing, you know, dealing with vibration. Same, 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 same. All that stuff's the same. So there's about an 80% overlap between a good drone and a good satellite. Can you explain how hard it is to traditionally make stuff with carbon fiber? Oh, and what's so unique about the Warble Composites solution to that? Sure. Um, one, of, one of the tools that we design um, actually works really, really good in the automotive industry. Uh, it turns out 3D printing with like an extrusion-based printer. I'm going to borrow this for a second. So I've got like a bunch of extruded plastic here. Uh, it does look very good. Um, this, this print ran all night, as you can tell. It's supposed to be a shoe. And so the thing is with this, this is just plastic. It's impossible to injection mold this. Right. It's just it's, the shape's a little bit too complicated. Yeah. Um, and this is not strong enough for its intended use. So we did this years ago. This is one of the first shoes we ever tried to make. And then you look at this one here. This is an actual product. You can actually race on this. Uh, we believe this to be the world's best cycling shoe. Um, so we're pretty proud of this one. And if you look real close, there's carbon fiber going every single which way on this thing. Um, all over it. And there's a lot of holes in it. Um, actually, the shell is 3D printed also. There's embedded metal parts. Um, so this, this guy is actually one of the most challenging carbon fiber objects that you could possibly make. And the reason why I say that is because the way the robot moves when it's printing is this crazy, ridiculous, you know, flip it over, spin it around kind of motion set that you just can't do with other tools. Well, why not? Well, if I've got a, like a tape gun that you use to uh, send a package to UPS or something like that, okay, you got a square box, you know, up and over the corners, no problem. Okay, now I want you to do the same thing and wrap a beach ball with no wrinkles, no tears, and no cuts. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Because you cannot turn at all on the surface. This allows us actually, we can, with our robots here, we can do a 180 degree fold over and just go straight back the way that we came. You can't do that with another process. So I'm going to steal this one here. And just to sort of exemplify that, if you can see uh, the details on this guy, you know, we've got these fibers that are coming down and they, they are having different radii of curvature throughout this part, but it's one fiber. So now normally this would be made out of two cones if we were to use an uh, uh, automated fiber placement machine. Two linear cones. This is not. This is a fully beautiful, uh, beautifully shaped rocket nozzle, um, and it's actually only one thread for the whole print. Insane. We don't have to cut that ever. So, so that's a new opportunity. When you have unlimited toe steering, haha, you can steer right over the toes of your shoe, no problem. Well, this is actually the essence of the problem because when you're when you're looking at car parts versus airplane parts. Airplane parts are nearly almost completely two-dimensional. A cylinder is about 2.1, 2.3 dimensions. You can, if you can wrap it up with a piece of paper, it's two-dimensional, right? But if you look at a helicopter, if you at a drone, a big one, and if you look at the hood of your car, that's terribly 3D. Yeah. There's a lot of stretching that needs to go on, and that's, that's what the coaxial extrusion tool allows us to do. The rocket nozzle, I think, leads to a great next question, which is like, all right, I can buy a shoe, how you'd make carbon fiber and use that to make a really great shoe. But for a rocket nozzle, talk about the thermal uh, I issues that you'd normally run into, no matter what material you're using and how you guys are solving for that. 
I'm um, sure. So there's, there's uh, two, two answers to that question. So one of them is, what is it made out of? Um, this, this is what we call a green body. So this is uh, plastic and, and continuous carbon fiber here. And so this is uh, pre-chemistry. This is a physical process of printing, the actual laying down of the fiber, the actual melting and remelting of the matrix. Um, and then this goes through various oven processes and, and other fancy chemistries in order to turn it into something like carbon carbon or silicon carbide with continuous carbon fiber holding it together. Those two materials can both go to like 4,000 Celsius or something. I mean, hot stuff. But at one third the mass, one third the density of uh, the same size metallic part. So when we think about uh, the, this huge explosion in these rocket companies, there were, you know, I don't know, over 100 rocket companies, something like that. They were using metal 3D printers that were based on powder. And, you know, they use advanced computation, advanced simulation, and really fantastic CAD design, people work, in order to differentiate their products. Well, at some point, everybody gets really, really good. And then the competitive moat tends to disappear because, A, you didn't build your unique printer technology yourself, purchase that. And then, B, given enough time, you know, uh, competition will arrive at the same destination. So what we wanted to do is think, okay, you know, the problem is that there is no 3D printer for a silicon carbide continuous fiber rocket nozzle, period. And because we can do funny things with our toe steering, we can actually give us a, uh, what I would call a computational match to the thermodynamic properties of a metallic nozzle. So, so think about this way. I've got my rocket engine, and then I've got my rocket nozzle that's made out of metal. This is like a skirt, you know, kind of shape. It's hollow inside. And then this is the throat. This is the end of the exhaust coat. And so, so you have the combustor up here, and... Normally what happens with a regeneratively cooled rocket nozzle, you have your uh, fuel uh, and it actually goes through a bunch of pipes. And this is basically, if it's made out of metal, a bunch of pipes that are welded together, it preheats the fuel, and then that ends up giving you about a 2% boost uh, in your thrust production. It also makes sure that the nozzle itself doesn't melt. So the most expensive part of a metallic rocket engine design is the simulation, the computation, and the work that goes into understanding what the thermal response of that system is going to be. Not just thrust, the thermal response of that system is a transient value that you need to know. So here's where metamaterials come in. A metamaterial is something where the material's properties are chosen without changing the chemistry. So, so if I have a bunch of aluminum and I add silicon to it, that's not just aluminum anymore. That's a different alloy. That's a different chemical. That's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is, if I end up uh, drilling a bunch of holes in this, or if I change the shape of the uh, channels, if I end up changing the direction the fibers go in three dimensions, I'm changing the, the three-dimensional heat field inside the nozzle. That's kind of new. And so what I, that allows me to do is 3D printed continuous fiber nozzle that actually matches the transient thermodynamic properties of a metal at one third the weight. Why would we do that? Well, it's interesting. You want to outperform your competitors, right? So what you can then do is say, look, I've got uh, something that's going to cut 2% of the mass out of your rocket system. You know what else is about 2% of your rocket? The payload. So if I can cut the mass of the rocket off the bottom, I can double the payload size just by decreasing the mass of one part. But that requires that there's a computational match between the old part and the new part because our customer is not going to want to redesign a whole new engine just for the nozzle. So if we can 3D print and then bolt on a huge upgrade, you can launch two satellites every launch. That's good money. Let's go. You have said some interesting things about the idea of solar. I think that, that's my prompt for you. I, I'm, uh, I'm curious to hear the solar master plan. Uh, we're going to build solar panels that work at night. Uh, they're not charged by the moon. Okay. That would only work about <laughs> once a month. So that plan's lunacy. No, what, what we want to do 
is actually um, build an artificial sun. Um, that might sound a little extreme, but it's required to build solar panels that work at night. You need another illuminator. And, and so uh, we're working with Virtus Solis on this. Uh, love you, John. That dude's really awesome. So what we want to do is, you know, take uh, large solar collectors, large solar panels, and now we're going to take the, the full spectrum, the full intensity of the sun at the Earth, which is about 40% more intense above the atmosphere than down here. So now you've got, it's even brighter. Right? And then instead of transmitting every color, we only transmit one microwave frequency. So the concept is, if I have solar panels or special wires or special antennas on the ground, say, then I could microwave those things from space 24 hours a day. So when you have solar panels on the ground, you end up with this surge problem where I get potentially more energy than I need a day, nothing at night, and I want to store that somehow. Well, if you just change solar dynamics and build a fake sun, totally real, um, then you end up being able to run your solar panels 24 hours a day. But they're going to be microwave panels or some sort of large space laser. But, you know, that's another story. So, so that's the big idea, um, is that we want to microwave solar energy to the ground 24 hours a day. And what's even cooler about that is that you could put those uh, rectennas, rectifying antennas, on other spacecraft and illuminate them with an energy source that's way bigger than the amount of energy that they could collect. Now think about electric solar, or excuse me, electric propulsion. You, can, you don't need solar panels for that. You don't need batteries for that. You could really start to push a lot of gas with that. And that starts to lead into interplanetary uh, travel quite well. Your, your core product is the ability to print stuff on orbit and on the ground, yeah. correct? But, but you guys are working on a variety of projects, some in the research stage, some in the production stage, all sorts of variety. Can you kind of just list some of the ones that excite you the most? Wings of any size, I would say that. So you're looking at drones, um, you're looking at uh, potentially manned aircraft, rotor blades, uh, kind of like this one, uh, drones like this behind me, um, and then also uh, wind turbine blades, which uh, the system we're building now, we want to actually be able to get to and go beyond 100 meters in length. That's more than double the width of the largest commercial airline. That's going to be done at a few percent the price. Um, and, and the cool thing about uh, wings of any size is they're all going to be made out of the same material, fundamentally, carbon fiber. So when you've mastered the robot, mastered the computer, and mastered the fiber itself you can start to build all kinds of great 3D shapes. Um, one of the other things that we can do um, is uh, over here, we have a, um, uh, an antenna. It's called a quantum field antenna. It's a new kind of antenna technology. And so when we sort of realized initially that we built a very small satellite factory, small enough that we could launch it, then the question is, what satellite part do we absolutely have to build in space? Like, like where are you stuck? You know, why, why can you not, is the question. And so one of the most expensive failures to your mission is going to be when you have this big umbrella-like antenna that costs you $70 million or more, and the thing gets unstuck, folded halfway out. And then you just don't have that part of your satellite working. So um, that problem is fundamentally constrained by the materials that antennas are made from. So if you have some gold-plated uh, carbon fiber mesh with like a silicon matrix, um, silicone matrix, it, it's, uh, it's very expensive. And, and furthermore, those things tend to degrade over time. Um, they get really crunchy and, and hissy uh, as they get older. So if we can build something that removes the hinge from the engineering paradigm, you're getting that workforce acceleration I was talking about earlier, where now I've got, I got one guy out competing five guys. But it, really think about it this way. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You want to design an umbrella? You think that's like super easy and stuff to like just whip one up on the weekend? It's, it's, it's a complicated machine. I mean, respect to the umbrella engineers, right? They don't weigh anything. But, you know, how many times has your umbrella flipped inside out in the wind? That's what I'm talking about. So how do we avoid that problem? Don't use metal. At all. 
But there's another hidden reason to this, which is that, you know, when you use metal, um, it has to be really perfectly smooth. The electron cloud itself is a two-dimensional object. So when you think about that, if there's any scratch of the surface of the metal, it's going to throw noise into the system. Uh, well, we just don't do that. Um, and then also you're going to have to polish it. You're going to have to machine it down. And then there's all those chips and that dust that's got to go somewhere. That's contaminant for the rest of the satellite. So what would be much better is if I just had some robot thing that could, like, you know, fire hose some plastic out, and then you have a, you know, a great antenna. So that's what that is, actually. That's double the power efficiency of a normal aluminum reflector, and it's flat. So what does that mean? That means if you use one of those on the ground station and you use one of those on the satellite side, your satellite needs half the power to get the same quality communication link. And it's just plastic. And when the robot is done printing it, it's done. There's no secondary post-processing. And even more ridiculous, you can start drilling holes in it and it still works just fine. Think about orbital debris for a second. That's a real problem. Yeah. James Webb didn't even get the first picture shot off before it got hit right in the eye with a rock. That's what I'm talking about. So if we have these robots crawling around, they can start to fix, repair, service, assemble, construct, and manufacture this whole thing. What inspired you to get into the broader interest of space engineering and physics? Were there books or movies you, you read and watched as a kid that inspired you? What was your, sort of, your journey to becoming a, a very active contributor and innovator in the space? Uh, I would like to say thank you to uh, the Stanford Mentors Group um, for sort of taking in a, a young kid, uh, more or less off the streets, you know, I was like 14 and ended up, you know, spending a couple of years with these older gentlemen. And they uh, let me sit in the um, room of 386 at the Duran building um, on, on Stanford's campus. And, you know, they ended up being the retired engineers from Fairchild and Intel and those Silicon Valley greats that got physics into the semiconductor, got the semiconductor into the market, built the motherboard. That's who these gentlemen were. And then they just start hanging out and talking about satellites all day long because they used to be a bunch of radar hacks, right? So I sat around for a couple of years uh, listening to these guys brainstorm and critique student projects. Um, then uh, they took me to go launch a rocket in the middle of the desert that I actually designed the autopilot for. What a gift to a 16-year-old, right? And so, so when I was looking at that launch, I was like, man, I could do anything could so what's it gonna be um and then uh i became an art major instead <laughs> but i kept asking why 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 and then eventually everyone got frustrated and i left and went right back to aerospace engineering and and got a formal education from embry riddle uh and Fodil college in los altos and that was uh, a wonderful experience uh, i started building drones because satellites like i said paperwork no uh, I had enough homework. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the story. And then I picked engineering physics specifically because um, it gave me the, the tools to ask why until I got bored. And then the tools to de 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 derive my own equations, which is what that antenna is. That's, we have a patented equation for that. Um, so that's kind of the why, the how of it. Uh, gratitude first and exploration second. And exploration leads to finding what one wants to do in life. Exploration of the universe. Um, you know, my, my mission today um, is to remove garbage from Earth. I'm not going to take it anywhere and launch it the sun. That's not what I mean. Uh, what I mean is uh, how do we get waste of a linear macroeconomic model to become a circular model of recycling? on the macroeconomic scale. Let me say that in a simple way. If I can 3D print carbon fibers, if I can 3D print wires, can I use the same robot system to take those wires off and put them back on the spool? Right. And then reuse them again? If I can do that... Hot dog, you got it. You mentioned printing blades and wings. That's one of the many projects we're starting to list. What are some of the other ones that you're, you guys are actively working on? Uh, well, we just, uh, 
we're working on wind turbine blades themselves, but also the tower. That's going to be concrete. Um, and, and furthermore, um, the actual semi-submersible craft that holds the floating wind turbines on top of the ocean. So the goal with that is if we can print the semi-submersible base, a giant concrete uh, three pillars platform, and that can move all around. And then you have the tower of the wind turbine system that could be filled with a giant hydrogen tank, for example. And then we've also made the blades. I mean, and I, by the way, I have a mobile factory we can just move around. Well, you could build those anywhere on land. You can build them on the shore and launch them. You could print them on a boat uh, and some dry dock thing. Um, and, and so now this gets to be very interesting for a couple different reasons. Uh, one of them is, turns out a wind turbine system's the same size as Starship, by the way. Actually, it's about twice as tall, maybe even bigger. So you could actually have uh, rocket launch facilities and wind turbine uh, towers basically anywhere in the world you want. Same printer, same materialists. So that's one thing. Um, but the real advantage of that system is when you start to have excess electrical capacity. And so, you know, wind turbine is going to sit there all day long. Well, what if you can't get wires out to the middle of the Pacific right? just for one wind turbine blades, uh, tower turbine, one wind turbine? Uh, you're not going to drag uh, wires out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean just for one wind turbine that's got propellers and it's moving. You're not going to do that. But, and these numbers are hard to verify, so forgive me for any inaccuracy, but um, I believe about 60% of the CO2 that's thrown into our atmosphere comes from shipping, container vessels and navies. So, so when we look at that as a primary problem, if those vessels were the ones that we upgraded to be running on hydrogen instead, now you're talking about uh, removing a tremendous source of CO2 from the atmosphere. And what happens if you spill the hydrogen? It turns into water in the middle of the ocean. No one cares. Right. It'll be fine. Um, so... But that's how you can actually get all the ships to be connected together with the new logistics system. Oh, and what would a rocket potentially use for fuel? An oxidizer? Water? So now you're back at hydrogen and oxygen again. That's the fuel system for space shuttle. So in one hand, you've got electricity production. And in the other hand, you've got the ability to catch and launch rockets. But they're built with the same manufacturing technique. That's valuable. So that's a big goal. And if that printing system is mobile, put that on the moon. Put that on Mars. Let's get to work. Let's go. You, you are literally planning to put the printing system on the moon. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, well, our Artemis uh, payload is a little, little bit different than that. Uh, we're not uh, on the first shot going to do um, the printer on the moon. Instead, uh, there's a theory that I'm holding on to for now. Um, uh, I'm sure there's a geologist in the audience that will correct me, or a selenologist, a uh, lunar geologist. And so um, when I was a kid, we used to play this game. They have like two, I mean, I'm in California. Uh, I found more, more California kids have played this than anyone else. And so you get two, two black rocks that have a lot of iron content, and you put them together like that. And the other friend, you know, he takes the third rock and he goes like this, like, like forever, like a hundred times. You know, it's basically forever when you're a kid. Well, it turns out these two get magnetized, hmm. but none of it's magnetic to begin with. It's interesting. So my theory is if you hit the moon with a large enough rock, you can stir up the magma in Earth enough to cause depletion of Earth's magnetic field. That's bad for the land creatures that have like DNA and stuff. So you get cancer. Um, but my point is, though, that if you and we, we don't know why that Earth's magnetic field has turned off or significantly weakened seven times. We know about the poles flipping. That's very rhythmic. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something else, which I believe is a magnetic gyre disruption. So if we hit uh, the moon with a large enough rock, then it'll have a big enough wobble in order to turn off Earth's magnetic field. And in order to prove or disprove this, my uh, current intention is to uh, build about a 200 or so meter um, laser ring gyroscope 
somewhere close to the South Pole of the moon. So we can very, very, very accurately measure what's going on. And then we'll deploy magnetic sensors all over the world and see if we can start to correlate uh, some of this data in a very precise way to see if we can catch the Earth's magnetic uh, uh, variance, strength variance, uh, relative to the lunar wobble. And if we can prove that association, uh, I think it would turn out that you hit the moon with a much smaller rock um, and you can get an extinction level event. Maybe an asteroid destroyed the dinosaurs by hitting the moon instead. Do you want to know? Begin to, to prevent this. We could prevent it. Um, maybe. That's a good use for nukes. Why, why should people care about uh, going to the moon, building stuff on the moon, going to Mars, building more things? Why, if, if someone wasn't sold on that idea, how would you try to sell them? Going to Mars is more important than going to the moon by a lot because there's no escape. There's no big red button. Uh, I'm out of here in three days, bye. No, it's like nine months or like two years before you get help. So mm, that's kind of distasteful. Um, and so you're not going to take styrofoam cups and things like that to Mars and just throw them out the airlock every time you eat dinner. That's really expensive. The cheapest thing in the world would be the most expensive thing on Mars because you can only use it once. That's pointless. And so if we're actually going to civilize that planet, not just colonize it, but we're going to stay, if we're going to occupy Mars, my friend, then what we need to do is consider if we're going to allow for a linear macroeconomic model or if we're going to go for a circular economic model that's built on top of a cyclic. I'll give you an Earth an example. The iPhone. So my iPhone um, is about 86% waste. For So if you buy a brick of metal, 86% of that gets on the floor before you end up with just the back case for the iPhone. Well, then they take all that metal shaving, they remelt it, and then they do another one. They remelt that waste, they do another one. Well, you start to integrate the amount of area under that curve, and what you'll find is that it never converges. That means if you're running an iPhone factory, you are going to spend an unlimited amount of energy in order to make iPhones through this recycling process. However, um, you know, if we could get that waste percentage down to like 2% instead of 86% every economic cycle, then that converges quite rapidly. This is important to understand economic growth because the, you're going to be adding people, you're going to be adding uh, mass, materials, you're going to be actively mining things in order to get more raw feedstock for your uh, economy, for your civilization. But on the other end, you're throwing almost nothing away. That's the fastest path to growth possible. If you had 86% waste on everything you dug out of the ground, it's just trash. Right. Interestingly enough, small fact about Earth, um, about 70 or 75% of all the aluminum ever mined is still in circulation on this planet. Hmm. That's one thing we recycle very, very well. Why do you think that is? Because it's easy to do. You know, when you have some rusted truck made out of steel that's been salted to death, yeah. you don't want to pull the oxygens off, and you can't go get the materials that are scattered all over the road. Right. It's just gone, like rubber. It's just gone in one cycle. We need to get bay on that. What are some technologies in super cutting into research coming in the next five to 10 years that, that you're most excited about? Let me, let me answer the first question one more time. So the other, the other reason why you need to go to Mars and, and build a fully recyclable civilization is because it's going to actually end up being incredibly low cost. But if you're using cheap materials and you have to get more cheap materials every time, or you have premium stuff, only the best, and you can recycle 98% of it, it actually costs less to use a better material. And furthermore, the menu of materials is not going to be 10,000. It's going to be like 12, like 15 different kinds of material. And then that technology, when brought back to Earth, will be absolutely dominant in terms of future factories. Because I'm just going to buy back my old cell phone cases, remanufacture that, and do another round of profit. That will make you more money but also will stop the waste, stop that giant plastic garbage patch in the middle of the Pacific. Stop it. Why is there a plastic garbage patch in the middle of the Pacific? Because we're using 10,000 10, different kinds of plastic and 10,000 different kinds of coatings, paint, and other things in order to build our products today. 
So by having a focused recycling target, you end up um, building a much simpler economic base on which to stand up your civilization, which will then remove the need for garbage on this planet. And that's why you go. That's why you stay. I, I think a lot of deep tech startups and startups in general have this like hyper focus on one thing. Yeah. Focus on, on a single thing. And I think you guys have with your, your printer and your, your robotics manufacturing technology, but you're also doing just a ton of different things with that. Yeah. Do you, does, does, does that ever like lead to some distraction? Uh, not all the time, but a bunch of the time we're revenue positive. So um, we've done it because it works. And, you know, uh, aluminum didn't actually really come into common usage until World War II. There was a chemist, I forget his name, apologies, but he ended up figuring out in his bathtub how to reduce aluminum, how to get the oxygens off. Napoleon, you know, his fork was made out of aluminum because it was a rare metal. But now you just throw your cans on the street. Right. Because the chemistry is different. So, but what do you make out of aluminum? Like everything. Are you going to tell the aluminum people to be more focused or something like that? No. It's a materials revolution. Use it for everything. That's the Great answer. Great answer. Um, what's been the hardest part about building or- orbital composites today? It's actually three businesses in one. And getting people to believe the complexity is a real challenge. Uh, I feel for all the founders out there, like, life can be really tough. Uh, especially when you, you have uh, a vision that's grand and a technology that's real, but the science is complicated. Um, investors tend to um, look at uh, and invest in things that they understand because they're trying to measure risk. So that's been a large challenge. And the way we've gotten around that is by just doing so much science and just improving um, materialism uh, for composites and proving it with flying drones that actually work, that's what we've been doing. And so because our things that we print work, because the robots print and we're printing on the side, we're printing on the ceiling, we're printing on the floor, we're flipping the shoe over upside down, the math in the motion of what we're doing is insane. There's no other printer like that. It's cool, man. And we've gone from science to cool. Uh, so that's how we're selling it now. And I can tell you that I can print parts for you. I can do manufacturing as a service. I can sell a printer if I want to. And ooh, my friend, we're just about to launch our X-Wing product into the market. It took 10 years to build the factory, but it takes six hours to build the product. That's what I'm talking about. And we did it through just plain perspiration and hard work. And some, some investment we're very grateful to also. And the Department of Energy has backed us up. The Space Force has backed us up. Air Force also. But very grateful to all of the contributors. Um, yeah, but uh, overnight successes, successes probably take about 15 years. So uh, I feel for you. But you can do it. What do you think most deep tech startups get wrong often? Uh, modern business school practices are about building the uh, commodities and commoditization of a technology as soon as it's possible in order to get volume up and costs down. Yeah. That doesn't always make sense. Like the car, the Konezig car, never going to be a commodity item. Some of the most advanced, you know, airlift valves and other things those guys are doing, absolutely fantastic. And they'll never go down market. They're not going to beat the race to the bottom. But, you know, but how are you going to ramp? How are you going to scale? So you have to show a path to broad market adoption a lot of times when it doesn't make sense. You know, if you're going to start a company, you need to build a monopoly. You need to build a monopoly, not beat everyone else out of the market. You need to compete with non-consumption. They're not doing it, and you're going to do it first. And because you got there first, your technology has to be really deep, really hard, really good in order to take that market before anyone else can get it. That's what Google did with information and your access to it. Um, that's what Intel did with the first generation chips and motherboards that they produced back in the day. They got there first, they dominated it, they built a market uh, monopoly, and then, and then they survived for decades on top of that. That needs to be your goal. If your goal is to go out and like, beat everyone else to the same punch, just wait a month. You'll get hit in the back. You'll see it over and over again. 
The other part is you need to keep asking yourself why. Why are we doing this? Why is that going to work? Why, why, like a seven-year-old, why, 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 why? Do that to yourself until you get to something that other people won't do because it's insane. Then it gets started. I'm going to print drones in outer space. I'm going to print miniature space shuttles, steal a satellite and bring it to the ground with something I printed on orbit. You know, let's see Santa Claus top that. Okay, that's how you do a deep tech startup. The, the reason I started doing these documentaries and interviews was to personally uh, steal people like yours time to learn, you know, <laughs> but, but, but also to try to inspire other people um, currently mostly, oh, mostly to inspire other people to, to go and, and think bigger, kind of like your experience that you described when you saw a rocket launch that you'd worked on. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you, if you ever think about inspiring other people and, and, and kind of the best ways to, to maybe approach that. I, I think encouragement's really important. Patience is really important. Um, one of the largest challenges with a space deep tech startup is the direct approach versus the indirect approach. Mm. And so if you take the direct approach to get on orbit, what does it look like? Well, I've got a new technology. I'm going to make that relevant to some spacecraft thing, and then I'm going to launch it, and I'm only going to be able to raise enough money to do it once. And then if it fails on the first shot, our technology and our company is dead. That's very common. That's horrible. That's very challenging, difficult. Whereas with the indirect approach, with laying siege to a technology, print something that, well, in our case, we print things that other people want, like this shoe. This has nothing to do with spaceships. It's just the right material and a shape that's interesting and challenging to my robot technology. Right? And so then, but then we're also going to do the drone. Then we're going to do this. Then we're going to do that. Then we're going to do the next thing. Well, it turns out by the time we're done, the whole time we've been telling the story of the direct approach. But in our tactical strategy, we've been surrounding the problem and waiting. Now it's like, okay, well, we should go to Axiom Space Station and put some robots on the outside. Oh, great. I'd love to. But if I don't, I still have a business that works. Mm. If my business grows, the core technology I'm really chasing, I can afford to fund that myself. How many shoes do I need to sell? A couple million? And then I can just launch a satellite in pure risk on my own. So if you're going to do a deep tech startup, you know, think about taking the indirect approach. Surround the technology that you really, the outcome that you want to have. And then, you know, build around that until the vacuum of the rest of what you're doing just makes it exist. The gates will open if you surround the castle. Just wait. Mm. So patience is really important. You've got to encourage yourself to be patient enough. This next question is just a little weird, but I think it's important. Um, can you try to describe how you think? What I mean by that is, are, right. are there any models you commonly have or lenses um, that you look through uh, at, at the world? Uh, that, that's a, a fun question. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, anyone that would see a shrink should have their head examined, uh, I think. <laughs> um, but also, if you're going to talk to yourself, you should wait for the echo. Okay. Enough jokes. All right. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I, I guess the thing is uh, reading is really important. Um, in, in the process of trying to figure out, I, I knew what my destiny should be. We're going to build flying cars. Well, that means they're about the size of a car. That means they're also going to fly, but it's not a helicopter, right? And helicopters are made out of sheet metal. So I need to figure out how to do the carbon fiber helicopter thing like insanely good. Right? Like that's, that's one push of it all. Um, and in order to get there, um, in order to be sure that the technology that we were going to develop was the right one, it required understanding every single, every other manufacturing process in history. I'm talking about mud, riverbeds, rocks, chipping rocks, adzes, you know, addle addles, uh, laser, nano machining, and everything else in the middle in every single material. And that took a year to read that stuff. And then when designing what the shape of that helicopter should be, that was five months of pure reading, nine hours a day. I read stuff for two years before I decided to do anything at all. So it's kind of like knowing every single move possible on a chessboard. It doesn't matter when you walk into the game. You know what happened and you know what's going to happen. 
So you can make a move right to the middle. That's the definition of mastery. So, so by mastering a lot of knowledge about manufacturing, then it was like, okay, well, what doesn't exist? I can see the hole in manufacturing and where the invention needs to fit. That took a long time to understand, but eventually ends up being just one nozzle inside of the other. That's it. That's very simple, right? Because like extrusion technology almost works like, like a hot glue gun thing, but it's not strong enough. Carbon fiber is strong enough, but I, it's not in the printer. So I should like put the carbon fiber nozzle inside the plastic nozzle. Okay. Okay. And then, and then, and then uh, like robots everywhere, right? Like, because <laughs> then I can cover stuff yeah. with fibers. And so that's kind of where the idea ended up emerging from. And um, yeah, that's kind of how we, how we got on our path. After that, it's just freaking work, man. Like yeah. this thing sucks, make it better. It still sucks, make it better. This thing broke, finish that, fix it. And just, just failing so many times that I screwed that up and now it works. So I, I have more bad ideas than good ideas and, and I'm not afraid to throw them out. I think that's really critical. Um, but again, you have to take the patience to learn and master a subject before you begin if you really want to own it. The people that copy technology have a challenge. The primary, there's two challenges. First off, you're in second place because you're copying someone else. And second, you don't know why they're doing it. Right. So you don't know what else needs to support it because you haven't done the homework. That's why just copying another startup as technologies go to deep tech, it starts to be impossible. Because you need those whys. Is there anything else you want to talk about uh, before I ask a, a final question that they'd like to cover? Yeah. Yeah. Because the question is, why go, to, why go to Marx? Right? That was one of the questions you asked earlier. Why, why do anything? Like, why build cutting-edge technology? Why go to Mars? Why go to the moon? Why try to expand civilization? Why, period, about human advancement and acceleration? Why is it important? Well, I got, I got three kids. And, you know, uh, this planet has been uh, not, not treated with forethought up till now. And it takes, it takes a certain amount of forethought to build a technology that will ultimately enable... Uh, a trillion people to live on this rock. There's plenty of room, but we don't have the available resources to get there because we keep throwing everything out. So that's, that's a critical challenge to overcome. And I think if we can leave the sun, not just earth, then that's a great future, right? Like, okay, so you want to leave the sun. Well, start with that as your goal. How are you going to do that? You need to go like super duper fast, right? So if we could take the asteroid belt and turn that into a bunch of steerable mirrors and focus that above the sun, you could get out of here real quick. Okay, well, take a step back from that. What do you need? Self-replicating machines. Robots that can recycle themselves? Okay, take a step back from that. Now we're talking about carbonaceous asteroids, silicaceous asteroids, and metallic asteroids. Okay, take a back step from that. Now you're talking about rocks on the ground. And then you go through traditional mining processes, and then you need to come up with a manufacturing system that can encapsulate the human condition, right? And then if you have the ability to encapsulate the human condition, that's recycling a civilization. Take one step back from that, and now you're in, in garbage land where we are now. So, you know, if we're going to be honest with our long-term goals and intentions in a complete way, a spiritual way, a technological way, an economic way, uh, a moral way, then your company will be ultimately successful. It will be unstoppable because it won't be self-defeating. And so, you know, I think the purpose of the universe is to learn of itself, to learn itself. Um, and you can't do that without experience. And you're not going to experience without exploration. So let's go. My last question for you is, um, what is your current life, life philosophy? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I sort of feel like you, I almost didn't ask it. I feel like you sort of just explained it in a way in that previous answer. I think that was pretty close. I think... Um, Ultimately, if I can build self-replicating machines, um, then this has been a good life as far as work. You want to know my philosophy is? It's very simple. Life is a swimming pool that you hold in your hands. You know, the more work you do, the more water you collect. And the better the work you do, the sweeter that water, the more people want to swim in, in your effect on time, you see. So, so if we do good work, if we're compassionate, generous, and kind with our actions, 
then the outcome of that will be that more humans will be able to survive in the future than survive today. That's the propagation of the species. It's why you have kids. So I think that's the biological drive through technological, uh, technological perspective. Cole, thank you for, for doing this and thank you for building orbital composites. Yeah. <laughs> this was great, Tim. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. You're, you're incredibly well read based off those answers. Uh, you, I mean...